What I'm going to talk about today is a line of thought that uh, we kind of started really in the context of the Virtual Worlds Exploratorium project. It's a project that we're involved in with uh, five different PIs over five different universities. And we've had a lot of people um, on this project, including a number of people that are in this room. And forgive me if I've missed anyone and haven't listed you. It's just been a really wonderful project. And the neat thing about it is, is that it really has been driven by both theory and uh, puzzles that arose due to the analysis of data that, w that happened during it. Now, another little piece of this is, is that I happen to be the director of an institute that tries to bring together humanists and social scientists with computational scientists and get them to do projects that advance both the computation side and the humanistic and social scientific side. And so when NSF put out a call for white papers on the future of the social, behavioral, and economic uh, uh, sciences. Uh, we uh, basically were working on a paper on this, and some of the thinking comes out of that. Um, and I'll have to uh, hope that uh, most of the people here today will grant that the social and behavioral sciences are, in fact, sciences. I recall one of my colleagues over in the, uh, an unnamed science saying to me, do you know how to know if someone isn't really a scientist? And he said, they, uh, they are in a discipline that doesn't have science after it. So uh, I guess as a social scientist, perhaps in some cases people would question it. But I hope you'll grant me that. Uh, in the VWE project, we uh, are analyzing game data from a massive multiplayer online role-playing games, uh, in particular EverQuest 2, and we're also doing some ones from, uh, we're going to start doing some from other ones. And we get downloads of data from the game companies. And the game companies design this data not for research purposes, but in order to allow them to manage the game and to manage the transactions and charge people and stuff like that. And it's typical kind of data. It's pretty messy. It has to be cleaned up and transformed. And we've applied a lot of different analytical techniques, including the ones here, pattern recognition and machine learning. And in the course of this, we, of course, have tried to test theories of group behavior, theories of networks and network evolution over time, um, and other kinds of theories. But we have also, in the course of this, had a number of interesting discoveries emerge. That is, things that we wouldn't have anticipated, that basically pose puzzles for us. And in fact, I've seen a number of those today. In Jerry Leskovich's uh, talk, I was really fascinated by the six different temporal patterns of the diffusion of, of uh, messages through the blogs. Um, and a lot of automics, there was another interesting, uh, interesting finding, that little curve down in the ratings as people grow older. Uh, those things for me all present very interesting puzzle, facts to be explored and explained. Now, as a social scientist, and I think anyone who comes from a discipline where you can separate theory and data, or theory and model, uh, uh, it would apply in the same way, we begin to think about how do we think about the relationship between theory and data. And as I have, as we've kind of pondered this and talked among <laughs> ourselves, and I'll take responsibility for most of the insights here, but I've certainly gotten a few from my colleagues, um, uh, a number of questions have emerged. And uh, I'll kind of go through three of those today and talk about some thinking that doesn't really give answers, but at least gets a start in the thinking down those lines. Now, maybe I should say a little bit about, uh, about uh, theory-driven inquiry in the social sciences. It's a, a traditional approach for the social, behavioral, and economic sciences. And theory is often thought of, and this is how we're taught, is that it's the beacon for inquiry. It's what leads us on and lets us formulate our research questions and enables us to advance. But there's a little bit of a dirty secret, I think, in much of the social sciences, and I think this may be true in other disciplines, is we rely so much on theory because our data is so bad. Uh, it's not much of it in a lot of cases before the era when we collected good digital data. It's got a lot of error in it. Um, it's messy and noisy, and it's pretty costly to collect. And so what we, what we do is we sort of use theory as a crutch to tell us this is what you should pay attention to. And as a justification, 
this is worth paying attention to because the theory says it is. And in fact, we've developed a number of theories of data. The various metrics, psychometrics, sociometrics, econometrics, are all theoretical formats that allow us to make often, to tell you the truth, <coughs> leaps of faith from theory to this measure corresponds to our theoretical construct. Now, the nice thing about data-driven inquiry, oh, my little slideshow isn't working very well here. Uh, the nice thing about data-driven inquiry, this is supposed to come as a little cascade, but for some reason it's not working, is that we often regard the theoretical beacon, I think of it more as a lamppost. And you all probably know the famous story of the drunk searching for his keys in the parking lot that he's dropped somewhere in the parking lot. He's looking around under the lamp. Somebody walks up to him and says, why are you looking around for your keys under the lamp? He said, because that's where the light is. And the theory sheds a very narrow beacon of light. And what we often hope of hope is that data-driven inquiry can actually serve as something more akin to parking lot illumination. So we could see the whole horizon. I seriously doubt it really is like that, but it kind of holds a beacon out to us in that respect. And looking at data-driven discovery in this respect, it leads us to begin to think about, OK, we have these new facts that emerge. We have these new discoveries that emerge. And we, they're untheorized. How do we begin to think about them theoretically? And that lay, leads to the first question that I ask. How do we think theoretically in a world of data-driven discovery? And you know, the tendency, of course, is that um, we don't reflect a whole lot on how we do science and how we do inquiry. We just have ideas and we think about it. But of course, there are people who've thought about those kinds of things. And there's a series of ideas that are rather interesting. Um, one thing to think about is to think about data-driven discovery, where we have that interesting fact that served up to us, as a surprise. It's chance. And as Pasteur says, chance favors the prepared mind. And it also becomes a stimulus for thought. Now, traditionally, when we think about how do we think about things, we go to the old, old turnips, deduction and induction. You know, we think from theory or we think from data and derive things out of our data. But there's a third route, at least a third route, and it's one proposed by the pragmatists here in the United States. Um, they were interested in knowing as a form of action. And I actually think their model fits scientific inquiry very nicely because that's what science is. It's acting to know. You know, it's investigating things and pursuing things. And they argue that most of us in life go through life in default mode. We follow our habits, you know. I get up in the morning and I shave and I don't think about it, and else I can't find my razor. It's only when I have a problem or a surprise or a hitch of the kind presented by data that I begin to think about it. And the pragmatists, in particular Charles Peirce, Charles Sanders Peirce, uh, came up with a, 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 what they thought was a mode of reasoning that dealt with these issues. And Peirce called it retroduction. And it actually subsumes deduction and induction and adds another duction, uh, abduction. And the notion that Peirce was doing is he argued that when we make sense of problems, we engage in a thought process that has some elements of play about it. In fact, he waxed poetic on what he called musement, or amusement, as we'd say in the United States, uh, thinking about things in a playful manner. But he also noted that it becomes increasingly systematic. In retroduction, we move backward. We see a fact, and you know theory is supposed to come before the fact, but we take that fact and we move backwards. And we try to find um, uh, some way in which we can comp comprehend the surprise. Now, Peirce thought that this is the nature, really, of all knowing. We just don't realize it because we're not aware of it. And he said there's one aspect of this that's left out, and that is abduction. And abduction, unlike the others, means leading away from the beaten path. It means that you may have a notion in your mind, but really the creative act of comprehending something means you jump out of the path and you look at something different. An abduction, according to Peirce, involves an aesthetic appreciation of the surprise. You know, he argued that, in fact, almost any choice we make in life is aesthetic, even choices of fundamental philosophical principles. 
And there's a sense, uh, though, within that aesthetic that it suggests a frame to adapt. And in abduction, you begin to focus the play. And you begin to entertain multiple theories, models, and frames. And you focus in on one. And I saw a really good example of this in Lot Ottoman's talk, where he had that little curve. And you said, well, maybe it's due to grumpiness, you know, not, not sleeping. Maybe it's due to the fact that we do this. You know, you, your mind plays. And then you light on one, they said, that, uh, that um, it proves to be satisfactory. Now, one scholar. Uh, who is a member of the Charles S. Peirce Society. God, you got to be fixated to be a member of a society named after somebody. But these people write specialized papers. And this one's interesting. She suggested there's a cycle in which these ductions occur. We note the surprising fact. We appreciate it aesthetically. We think abductively. We then fasten on one thing that we've thought of abductively and deductively work it out. Then we inductively, either by facts in our head or by a more systematic uh, uh, study, uh, test it. Then we go back to abduction and deduction. And there's just different kinds of cycles of this kind. Now, is this necessarily the right answer about the way this happens? It's plausible. Probably not for everyone. There's probably people that emphasize different aspects of it. But I think it's interesting and important to grapple with these things because it's important to think through how we think in order to, to clarify the relation of theory to facts. And so I think there's some utility in taking this framework. You know, an interesting thing is, is it recognizes there's not one right way, not induction, not abduction, not deduction. It also forces us to think about the question is, should there be a balance among these processes? You know, like if I'm only thinking deductively, does that put me in some kind of epistemological danger? Ought I to try to think? using the other modes. Is there a certain order in which these could occur? Are there methods for abduction? You know, these are all interesting questions. You know, there's people that write these long books about creativity that list thing after thing after thing that makes you creative. A lot of those are abduction techniques. But none of them, of course, are very proven. Could we turn this into an algorithm that a machine could execute, potentially? You know, it's all very interesting kinds of questions that I don't frankly have the answer for. But I think that retroduction in spelling this out, the pragmatists put their finger on something that seems intuitively right to me about the way that I tend to think about and will have to think about these surprises that data form. Well, that leads to a second question, which is a little bit more general one, is how would data-driven discovery and theory-driven inquiry interact during the research process? You know, if we're going to allow for both of them to be there, how do they relate to each other? Well. And this is on the assumption, of course, that we grant that it's important to consciously think through this relationship and that we may want to bring forth both of them in our scholarship. I've always found this framework to be a pretty useful one in thinking. This is actually sociologist Robert Like, a former colleague of mine at University of Minnesota, and Barbara Meeker put forward this in 1975. And this is a theory model data triangle about the relationship of mathematical models to other kinds of theoretical thinking. And I think we can extend this to some extent to some of the data-driven modeling processes that we have, but only to some extent. I'll make a qualification here. They distinguish theory, which in the social sciences and in other sciences is often verbally cast up, but could be cast up in equations that are very abstract, from the data that we use to test that theory, which is always instantiated in the world in a particular form and has particular kinds of flaws in it and particular limitations and never fully reflects the theoretical constructs. And then at the other end of the triangle, the model, in this case, a mathematical model, which is a very abstract representation in a rigorous formalism of the theory. The model itself is inevitably an instantiation of the theory. The theory is always more general than the model. The model makes certain assumptions. And the model can be laid up against the data. But the data is also never quite fits the model. And therefore, you have those different inferential processes that you have to have which I will not go through, which are probably fairly obvious to everyone. I think the triangle is a very interesting thing for several reasons. And it's useful, I think, to think about how data-driven discovery can relate to theory-driven inquiry. Oh, by the way, it's tempting to think that the yellow oval is theory-driven inquiry. 
And the little light green oval represents a data-driven inquiry. But I don't think it's that simple. And I'll get to that in just a minute. Now, I think that this is a very useful model for several reasons. Number one, it makes some distinctions that I've always found fairly useful and that help me make sense of how my mathematical models would relate to verbal models, would relate to the world. And with mathematical, we can say statistical as well as mathematical. But, oh, don't do that. But number two, I think, and Like and Meeker really didn't bring this out much, but it has some useful normative implications. Uh, in particular, you notice that when we're moving from theory to model, from model to data, and from data to theory, we're making some mappings. We're assuming that measuring a particular variable really represents a theoretical construct. We're assuming that the mathematical operation in the model really represents what the operation in the theory is depicted of. And a question we can ask is, how valid are those? In other words, this offers, begins to offer us a tool for saying, how do we relate these to each other? And how valid are these relationships? Further, I think they also have historical implications. One thing about science is it happens in time and space. It doesn't happen in a formless vacuum. And therefore, you start at one point or one vertex and move to the others. So what if, for instance, you start at the data vertex first? What limitations does that put on your theory? What if you start at the uh, model vertex? What implications does that have for your thinking? And, uh, and uh, so we, we can wonder about things like that. For instance, we started thinking in some of our analyses about, uh, of the EverQuest data, there's a phenomenon in EverQuest that they call mentoring. And it has a certain structure to it. And we then went out and found all kinds of theories of mentoring. You know, it's a piece of our data. It's a variable name. So we went out and found all kinds of theories of mentoring and messed around with it for about a year before I finally figured out that it isn't really mentoring. It corresponds more closely to the phenomenon in management that would be called coaching. So we can learn something about training from this. But in a way, our data distorted our theory. Now, that's a very silly example. We should have realized that a long time ago. But I think there's all kinds of these transformations when you jump from one to another that you have to think through, how is that limiting me? Is it introducing some kind of drift into the thinking that we're having that makes it inconsistent with the theory? Now, here's what I think is probably really the more accurate picture. I really think that probably for both our data models, for example, decision tree predictions that we might make, uh, that's one thing we've done in, in the EverQuest data. We're using the EverQuest data to try to predict real-world attributes like personality profiles from in-game behavior. And we're using decision tree and machine learning models to basically identify which of a whole bunch of variables predicts. And I believe that within that machine mining world, there's a theory of decision trees. There's also a particular model. There's a whole bunch of different decision tree algorithms. And there's also data that it draws on. Just like in the world of theory and model and data, there's that same kinds of things. And I think that the correspondences between those are really worth exploring. Now, in some cases, I think that the data is probably identical. But I think that in other cases, it isn't. For example, in our game data, we have survey data that measures trust. We have in-game data that measures trust according to, for example, whether you give people access to your house or not. Are those the same thing? Do we think about trust? You know, you might think about trust very differently, uh, thinking about it as a survey response, which measures a psychological state, supposedly, versus a behavioral state of trust. And things get even more complicated. Let me just end the slideshow for just a second. If you really think about the theories that we bring to bear to trust, this is a rather simple theory of trust from the social sciences. And yet, you know, if you look at how we talk about trust in the game world, a lot of these concepts don't get tapped at all. If they're all bringing to bear, we're sampling only a very small portion of the theoretical background of trust. And there may be other parts of it that will significantly change uh, our understanding of trust if we were able to uh, operate from them in the game world. So in any case, it invites us to, ex to entertain 
some interesting ideas about correspondences. You know, for example, what's the relationship between our substantive theory and our data model? That would be that one and that one. And um, so, for instance, in one of the things we've had to do in EverQuest is to find groups. Sony was not very kind. They didn't tell us these people are in a group. We have to identify groups by their time, their space, what tasks they're engaged in, and things like that. If you go back to the theory of how you define groups, there's a theory called the theory of group entitivity. It specifies eight different dimensions that define a group. We can measure three in EverQuest. So our data model can only incorporate three of the things. Are we really measuring entitivity? What kind of shift has been made by doing that? Is it good enough for government work, or have we fundamentally changed the theory? Interesting notions about these kinds of correspondences. You can also look at the correspondences between the two theories. Is the theory underlying decision trees, which identifies uh, pardon me, which identifies personality attributes based on single variables, how does that map onto personality theories in the real world, which are based upon types and syndromes, <coughs> where clusters of behaviors go together? You've got a one-on-one -on -one mapping in the decision tree. You've got a clustering mapping in your theory. And there's various other kinds of correspondences and relationships we can look through. It's almost tiring to try to think through going all of them, and you probably dreaded that I might try to go through all of them. Why I think this is useful is, is that considering this model makes us think through systematically and carefully the various kinds of assumptions and mappings that are occurring when we're doing this kind of inquiry and what we might be leaving out. It also invites us to, just as Clyde Coombs created a theory of data a number of years ago, we could create a theory of mappings based upon that. It also makes us aware of the historical nature of the research process. Wherever you start in that triangle may constrain later choices. And it may make you more or less invalid. There may be various kinds of shifts that occur as you move from vertex to vertex over time. So there's various kinds of usefulnesses, I think, that come out of considering that. Now, the last question I'll ask, actually there's another question, but I'm, I'll, uh, I'll introduce that at the end, is a more selfish one. As someone that works in a discipline that uses theory a lot, I ask myself, how can you people that are dredging around in the data help me? Well, typically, the way things happen is that we have uh, the kinds of insights that I see generally that come out of data-driven approaches are generally ones that are consistent with a structural equation model or a flat model. But there are a number of social science models that are quite different from this. And let me just briefly mention three. Contingency theory, multi-level theories, and process theories. You're going to have to have a very different kind of data-driven inquiry to be able to feed that kind of theoretical thinking. A contingency theory is a theory that's concerned with what makes people effective in the world? And the assumption is, is that situations change and that your responses have to change and that you have to pick the right response for the situation if you want to be effective. Here's a very simple one, classical. Organizations can structure themselves two ways, as a hierarchy, which is very rigid, or as a more organic form, which is very open and flatter. Organizations can encounter two kinds of environments, structured, stable environments, that are fixed and that are very predictable, or turbulent environments that are changing constantly, like the last two years in our economy. Contingency theory would say would take the possible situations and match the responses to them and make an argument that some responses are more effective than others. And here's what contingency theory of organizations says. If you've got a stable environment, the hierarchy is more effective than the open organization, the organic form. If you've got a turbulent environment, the organic form is more adaptable. It'll work better than a hierarchy. Notice what we have here is we have something complicated. We have the need to take one set of situations, match it with another set of responses, and sort them out according to effectiveness. I know that can be done, but I don't see a lot of the data-driven inquiry as giving me data that can feed into that kind of theory. Another kind of theory, oh pardon me, another kind of theory is multi-level theory, very co popular in education. And the assumption is that the world has multiple levels. Think of your kid in school. There's the individual kid, there's the classroom, 
there's the school, and there's the community. Each of those has been shown to exert a separate and qualitatively different kind of emphasis on educational performance at the student level. And education people have developed theories that basically argue that, um, well, one kind of theory says your lower levels are affected by all the higher ones, but that actually it's the relationships across the levels that make a difference. Once again, we need discoveries in the form of cross-level relationships, and relationships that can make differences as you move up and down level to really be able to feed usefully into that kind of theory building. And there's a final kind of theory, and that's process theory. What process theories do is they focus on how processes unfold over time. So this morning, the six different kinds of development in this form of the blogs, uh, of the responses in the, in the, in the uh, news world, those represent the kind of input you need. You need overtime patterns, really, for these <coughs> kinds of theories to do. And, but they have one other thing, is process theories are a lot like histories. You know, in histories, we have an unfolding of things over time but we also have critical events and critical junctures, single things that set the course of history over time. And to really be able to inform that, you'd really have to provide both kinds of evidence and information. In other words, what I'm saying is, is there may not be a nice mapping of the kinds of information we get out of current predictive or, or data-driven models and the kind of theorizing we want to do. You can say on the one hand, that's your problem, theorists. You know, you need to figure out how to develop a theory based on that. But you can also say on the other hand, it sure would be helpful if people could identify some of these different kinds of relationships that we're talking about. Now the last question is, is how can theory-driven research best serve data-driven research? And my answer to this is very simple. You know, I guess I would like the data-driven people to address that question uh, because it's not the kind of research I do. I tend to interact in the other direction. So where are we? I think right now my thinking on this is definitely at the abductive stage. You know, we're having a lot of little things that it invites um, working out. And it also invites contextualizing into different areas. Because, you know, on the one end, there are things like where Ann Barabasi's talk, where you, mathematics and networks are, I'm not sure there's that much difference, distance between theory and data in that case. On the other end, there's the social and behavioral and economic sciences where there's a clear difference. There's a lot of other disciplines in between. I'm not sure I can speak for them. I think these concepts make some sense in the way I think about or talk to some people in those disciplines, but it has yet to be determined. So anyway, that's the relationship, maybe, a little bit about the relationship between theory and data. So, uh, sorry, can you guys hear me? Okay. So, uh, really interesting, and I wanted to see if we could explore that last question that you asked uh, that right. you didn't uh, uh, know the answer to, or vice versa, the interaction of the two. Um, so, I don't know, some people in the room might be familiar with uh, David Jensen's work at UMass Amherst, and uh, one of the things that he works on is that in uh, when we're trying to sort of uh, find exogenous variation or quasi experiments with which to test causal assumptions, uh, econometricians have long, uh, you know, relied on intuition to find uh, in the world exogenous variation that can help us identify uh, some of our parameter estimates. And what he's working on is creating algorithms that search through large data trying to identify uh, instances of quasi-experiments. Uh, if you feed an algorithm some uh, conditions which would identify a quasi-experiment, something that seems exogenous uh, to the question that you're after, then maybe you can train an algorithm or, uh, to search for those conditions in data. And I guess my question to you and to other people here is that how much do you think that that is feasible or do you think that there is just some, you know, level of intuition 
that is uh, needed from, from the researcher themselves to guide you in finding interesting sort of things like exogenous variation in, uh, in social systems, that you have to know something about the social system in order to understand really what's exogenous and, and to what extent do you really, can you really rely on data driven uh, sort of methods? And that's a question for me. Yeah, well, for anyone, but, but for you, if, if somebody could give you a... You know, I, I actually, um, the, the answer that comes to my mind really goes back to that triangle, is I don't think any of them can be independent of the others. I think theory, frankly, becomes a little bit sterile if it isn't you know, corrected by a surprise every now and then. And I, I think back to, do you all know about Tetrad? It was, a, it was back in the, what was it? That was been 1988, 87, 88, where some people developed a, a, a similar algorithm that would shop for causal models in a set of data. And, you know, it's at, you've never heard of it, have you? If it had re revolutionized inquiry the way it was supposed to, you'd probably have heard of it. And I think it's exactly because they just need to feed into each other a lot. But that's a, are there, are there other answers or other opinions on that, you all? I'm really trying to learn here about this, so. Just what you just said causes me to pull up one of my favorite quotes. So it's uh, by John von Neumann in 1953 who said, mathematical ideas originate in empirics, but once they are so conceived, the subject begins to live a peculiar life of its own and is better compared to a creative one governed only entirely by aesthetic motivations. As a mathematical discipline travels or after much abstract breeding, it is in danger of degeneration. Whenever this stage is reached, the only remedy seems to me to be the, rejuven <clears throat> the rejuvenating return to the source, the reinjection of more or less directly empirical ideas. <laughs> Can't say much more than von Norman. <laughs> we have access to these large amounts of data, is there a real benefit to using all of that large amount of data or do we, can we make do and get the same insights with smaller amounts of data? So it goes back to your lamppost example, that just because we now have a beacon that exposes us to you know, the, the billion triples that Jim Hendler was talking about, uh, is, is it, I mean, do we really need to use that or are we able to make a lot of the insights that we can with much smaller amounts of data, just like an example would be, you know, we could actually do a census and f find out how everyone in this country thinks about a political election, but we do pretty well with a sample of about 3,500 to get an estimate for the nation. Is there an equivalent in the context of the web, or do we really need to, to is there an argument to be made for using the large amounts of data that we have access to, in theory building or data driven? Again, this is a question with Scott, but also open up a discussion to others. Yeah, actually right now I'm kind of drunk with the really neatness of having a lot of data and having a fact I can sort of think is a fact, you know, as opposed to, well, there's a relationship here between the variables, but it has this much standard error around it, and it's got, you know, that and that. So I've found it to be very tonic, <laughs> frankly. I say the more data, the better, but, uh, but uh, I'd be interested in other thoughts. Um. Uh, Rob Ackland from the Australian National University. This is actually just a response to Nosh's uh, question and comment. Um, I mean, uh, uh, my background as an economist, um, it, uh, I've learned that you know, when there's a, a census available, you, you don't use it. You use a sample that's drawn from the census. Because um, if you use a, a, a you know, a um, you know, if you have millions of observations in your regression equation, then then you're biasing all the coefficients to be significant. Um, but in the question of the web, um, my question, uh, my answer would be um, that it, it all depends on whether you need to know more about the nodes than what you can find out through um, automated means, like i.e. graph theoretic properties or um, understanding about the nodes through um, text and automatic, 
automated text analysis. And if you want to go, if you're testing theories that involve knowing more about websites or nodes within large scale act, uh, networks, then I think you need sampling approaches um, um, and, and then inferential, statistical inferential approaches that, that then um, involve the use of samples. So I guess it depends on the questions that you're asking. Yeah. Ramesh? Uh, I don't have a question, but I have just uh, some experience to share with you. In my last life, uh, I used to be a computer vision researcher, working on uh, analyzing images and video. And as uh, many people may know, that computer vision has not made as much progress as uh, it has received the attention. The problem is exactly what you were pointing out to. And uh, that is, uh, until you know exactly which subset of the data is relevant to the problem or theory that you are trying to solve, you cannot really use that data meaningfully. And that's why people try to do something that we uh, used to call <coughs> segmentation problem. Until you uh, solve the segmentation problem, you cannot recognize the objects. Yeah. Now, perceptual scientists have also been uh, struggling with this particular problem. So having lots of data does not necessarily help you until you can go and find out which particular subset of data is really meaningful and then you can start applying some of the techniques. Yeah, it is interesting you mentioned image analytics. I, I, one of the projects that our institute has is trying to identify authorship using image analytics and machine learning. And it's really bringing an interaction between the humanists who are talking about their theories of authorship with the, the computer scientists. But it's only possible because they have well-bounded corpuses of quilts in this case or maps in another case to work on. Do, does anybody who uh, does data mining have any exemplars of situations in which, on the basis of data mining, uh, you think that a theory has emerged? That is, can you point to some to examples that say, uh, we went out and we, we, we did this kind of, of data mining, and now we have this theory? Um, because data mining is inherently exploratory, there's no confirmatory aspects to it at all. And so you can use data mining techniques to go through your data to find out stuff, but eventually you're going to have to do confirmatory stuff probably on different data. Because that's the only way you believe that your type 1 error is really a type 1 error rate. Okay, so, uh, Just to continue, do you know of any example? which anybody has done the, the data uh, exploration and then went out and did the confirmatory aspects. So the um, that are used in stat departments, um, the theory of, of machine learning, statistical machine learning, ha has many examples of good statistical techniques that then lead to theory ideas and confirmatory stuff. So I think there's a distinction. I think machine learning is exactly what I was thinking of. Machine learning is a great example of you try it in a test data set and then you try it in others and you, and you keep improving it, et cetera. And there's a lot of progress that has been made it's in computer science in doing that. But there is still a distinction between what I think comes out of those very successful ventures and what I think is part of what Scott was arguing from a social science standpoint. And that is to say, you can have a very sophisticated, um, a model with high precision and high recall after going through a series of training data sets. But if you ask the, 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 the program to say, can you substantively explain to me why it is doing X, Y, and Z, or what is the reason it's putting these people into these categories, that still becomes a very tricky issue. Well, that, that's because it's backwards. Theory construction has to come first. Theory construction and your hypotheses have to guide your data oh, no, analysis. No, no, no. Can't, can't, can't disagree more. Can't say. disagree more. Genomics, full of counterexamples. I think you kind of move KDD along. Oh, it depends you if you if you actually are going to do confirmatory statistics. Well, KDD techniques have been used 
significantly in genomics, finding stuff from the database and then testing them in the chemistry. On different so, data. On different on, data. On, well, on, on actual organisms. Exactly. On and I, yeah, yeah so that's three, just but, fine. Well, but, but where was the th first the theory formation? You said that's, I have to start yeah, from the theory. But, but eventually it comes down to theory formation. Eventually it comes down no to, to the next step in science. Yeah. Galileo did a bunch of experiments and Kepler a bunch of observations and then Newton come up with the theory yeah. of gravitation. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, what? it's um, I'm I'm confused. Um, no, I, I don't think I I, I I think I think we all agree with you. At least a large number of us do. I, I I come back to the question that you have a lot of different successful models that uh, that. Have I mean there's are we working with data mining people? They have all these suite of tools, things like Weka, for example. They have a whole series of tools, and they make very high precision and recall. But substantively, trying to understand why it is doing what it is doing, so that we could build the theory, generate the theory, do you know, do what Newton did after what Galileo did. Those are the kinds of things that I, I, I we struggle with, at least from our, from the point of view of social scientists. And I'm Eventually, it comes down to the scientific method in statistics. Eventually, it comes down to, okay, we've got all of these tools that computer scientists have generated. Eventually, it comes down to doing real experiments, generating real data, and testing real hypotheses. But I do think there is some questioning about that. I mean, you know, like, for instance, the issues of science that have come out about data, new ways of knowing. I think that, I, I agree, Stan, I mean, you know, that was how I grew up. But I really think it's partly due, frankly, to limitations in data. I think really a, a whole model would have all three vertices and you'd be cycling among them and I'm not sure any one of them is complete without the others, frankly. I think these new methods that we're using, like John Wyatt described and some others, are capable of producing really interesting obdurate facts that we then have to puzzle out and figure out whether they break our existing theoretical paradigms. And it, you can't probably do that without getting your models fairly precise and then cycling back to the general theory and so on. Yeah, we might be out of time. Uh, five, five live mics at one time. <laughs> uh, but we'll give, oh, let's have two Please. more comments uh, and, and then we'll take our break. Yeah, I, I, I think, Kevin, you had, had uh, Yeah, I think experiments, data, and the theory it, it always go, you know, hand by hand. It's more like a chicken egg problem, right? You can, it's very hard to say which one in the chicken comes first or egg comes first. Uh, in scientific discovery, many of them, uh, you know, first work out, you know, some conflicting facts and, and sit back and think and work on new theory. Or some people work out theory and then do experiments. So I think the, if both sides can give lots of examples. I think this is more philosophical you know, debate rather than psychological. psychological. Yeah, it could be. Okay. Uh, go ahead. And you know, it, in, a, in a way it is, and you know, that's what I just said a minute ago. But then there's the other side of the coin, which is that there are different people that pursue different routes among those very successful. You know, like Sam was saying, you know, theory first, then test it statistically, and so on. Other people pursue other ways. Those are probably, you probably don't have to incorporate all three kinds into every inquiry you have. And some people are going to prefer one over others. I'm just not sure there's one way that's made. Ron, I think you had your hand up. Um, oh, geez, you're right behind me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the, the project that I'm, I'm with Scott uh, on, initially I was shocked at the data mining because it violates all the rules of correct behavior in the social sciences, which is grub through the data as much as you can, breaking variables at points and get whatever correlation you can. So the, and it's just verboten, yeah? But in watching really smart people do this, I came to an appreciation, which is one of the nice things about a meeting like this, I came to an appreciation that if you have a complex system in equilibrium, you can get really nice explanations. One reason why we don't do that, we social science usually, is that we're trying to predict what's about to happen uh, in a disequilibrium uh, system. I mean, sociology is a disequilibrium. So if you're amortizing over time in a shifting environment, data mining is really hard to interpret. Uh, if 
If, though, you're analyzing demand for the computer at a campus system that's in a steady state, it's a fantastic way to predict. So I don't know that it's psychology so much as the kind of task that you want to do. In certain kinds of things, the data mining is fantastic. For what we usually do in selling to management, in uh, writing and sociology, uh, it's, it's almost heathen behavior. So six of one, half a dozen of another. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, let's give a round of applause for Jay Wee and Scott for a very interesting presentation.